And so we worked with the Miller, the Molson, Coors of the world. They're all working on sustainability initiatives. That's what we do at Greenleaf. So I said, let's bring in some of the major purchasers in their areas and work between the parties that aggregate the, the, um, the purchasing and get it out to the consumer. And how do we get them engaged to pay the farmers for best practices to protect our land and our water and bring more nutritious you know, food into the supply chain for my grandkids and for yours? So that's a little bit about what this forum's about today. And we're very fortunate to have Larry Clemens here. He's going to talk about the Midwest Roll Crop Consortium. TNC is a leader in engaging cooperatively, collaboratively with parties industry across the country. Larry leads North Americans Ag. Okay, a lot, he talked earlier on the policy side, but they're a real force in engaging the industry. We're gonna hear from him about what's going on in the upper Mississippi River, and then Bill is gonna share with us what's going on at Cooper Farms, you know, turkey production. Um, I think it's hundreds of, of um, producers that you work with. You're gonna tell us more, and then Marco is gonna tell us about how Milson Molson Coors has been collaborating, and actually hundreds out in the you know, Colorado area, hundreds of farmers they've been engaging to help them protect their soil and their water. And I think he may actually open up open bar for us later on with a little bit of drink, you know, at, at um, not, you know. Not in this secret place now, but. Okay, very good. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over. I think we're gonna start, Larry, with you. I wonder, and are you gonna just advance the slides? We don't see a clicker up here. I think that's just the TV remote there. Yeah. All right, well, thanks, John, and thank you all for sticking sure. around. Last session of the day, and uh, hopefully we do get a cold drink afterwards uh, at all. But uh, I, want to, I wanted to share this a little bit. Certainly the Nature Conservancy is not buying grain. Uh, we're not uh, in the supply chain, but we're certainly working with many companies that are in the supply chain and are trying to work better and better with farmers. Uh, so I wanted to share with you a little bit about the Midwest Row Crop Collaborative. I expect probably not many people in here have heard of this because it's a couple of states west of here. But still, I think it's an important example of how the food industry and, and overall the entire supply chain, when you think about from the input providers to the grain processors to consumer packaged goods, the retailers and restaurants are starting to think about sustainability and what their role can be in it in helping farmers adopt conservation practices. So I'll tell you a little bit about the collaborative and then some of the inv early investments that they're starting to make and all. But I do want to start with a little bit of the history of it. So this really started in uh, 2014 when the CEO of Walmart, and can you imagine that, when the CEO of Walmart calls you likely come, right? So he pulled together several uh, big corporations in the food industry and a few NGOs and said, you know what, we need to do something about sustainability in our supply chains. And quite honestly, many of the companies, and uh, you know, you may hear more about this today, many of the companies have been focused on supply chain uh, within their facilities and within their transportation and they're starting to look up and down their ingredients into the supply chain around sustainability. Why are they doing that? One, it makes good business sense for them in many cases, and there's many examples of where it simply is better for the bottom line. Uh, but they're also seeing the consumers demanding it, and they're also seeing their shareholders and investors de demanding social responsibility and sustainability. And so those companies came together in 2014 and agreed, those CEOs of these companies, and I'll, I'll get to them in a second, came together and agreed they want to do something in the Mississippi Basin. They all have, uh, they all source ingredients from those areas. They have a, a significant footprint in the Mississippi Basin. And they really charged, ultimately, the three NGOs, which was the Nature Conservancy, Environmental Defense Fund, and World Wildlife Fund, to come up with a plan that then they could start to implement. You can see some of the companies that are here. Uh, three have joined us in the past year. Uh, McDonald's, Lando Lakes, and Unilever all joined us in the past year. But again, you can see this represents 
most aspects of the supply chain, from the input providers through the processors, the retailers, and the consumer packaged goods companies. And I would add here, this activity is all at the CEO level. The CEOs get together and talk about this project. And then it trickles down to the sustainability officers and directors like myself to actually go out there and implement this work. One of the things I want to make clear is this group that's come together is not trying to create something totally new. They're really trying to come in and complement efforts that are already out there in the places that we're starting to work. They also want to educate consumers, which is really important. We hear that consistently from the agricultural community. Can you help educate the consumers on the practices we're doing on our farm and the good work that we're doing? And that ties back, quite honestly, to the panel we had uh, earlier around policy. If consumers are better informed about the practices that many of you are doing around sustainability, they can simply help shape better policy. The goals that we have put together, and these are pretty aggressive, we admit, as we put together these goals. But again, think of those companies that are at the table here. Some of the goals align very nicely with the Gulf of Mexico Hypoxia Task Force goal of a 20% nutrient load reduction by 2025, uh, ultimately uh, leading to a 45% nutrient loss reduction by 2035. Uh, we're working in Nebraska. The three states we ended up working in are Illinois, Iowa, and Nebraska. And so there's a, a sustainability focused in Nebraska around water usage and irrigation efficiency. And then in Iowa and Illinois, it's really focused on nutrient load reduction, as you see in these goals. The strategies that we're doing. We're starting to work in a few key watersheds, and I'll touch briefly on that. We're supporting the Soil Health Partnership in a significant way. That's an initiative led by the National Corn Growers Association that's creating demonstration sites for soil health. I think there's only a couple of those sites here in Ohio but they really start in Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, and then on uh, some of the surrounding states there. We're developing this program that probably not many of you have even heard of yet, but it's with the Tri Societies, it's with the Ag Retailers Association, and it's with Field to Market, called the Sustainability Programming for Ag Retailers and CCAs. We all need to continue to be educated on how this sustainability is starting to impact agriculture on the ground and we know that the ag retailers, the certified crop advisors are the ones that are the trusted advisors to farmers. They are looking at some policy so they are starting to get involved in the farm bill and that's new for many of these companies. You think of General Mills, some of them, they've not been active in the farm bill before but they realize to meet these goals they need to get active in the farm bill. I think that could be very positive for us if we can educate them in the right way to interact in the right ways to support policies that advance our conservation work. And again, they're engaging consumers, which is critical, and they have that ability to do that. A little bit on our priority watersheds. I, I'm gonna skip through these slides really fairly quick because I'd rather hear the other two speakers here. I, I think really just wanted to introduce you all that this is happening. These companies are setting very aggressive sustainability goals and when you, you, actually when you map out, Walmart has set a goal, they call it Project Gigaton. And it's about reducing greenhouse gases. One of the ways that they have figured out to reach their greenhouse gas reduction goals is by working with farmers to promote cover crops and nutrient management. To reach their goals, they need to touch about 76 million acres of row crop land with cover crops and nutrient management. Many of the things we've talked about here today. And so we need to figure out how do we engage them to help many of you as farmers out here adopt those practices. What's that value proposition between them reaching that goal? And it may not be in terms of, of direct money to you. That would be the great and ideal simple way but there may be other ways that they can invest in helping this movement. I've said they've invested in Soil Health Partnership, the SPARC, policy, 
some of the investments early on. This group has really been active now for about a year and a half, and they've invested six and a half million dollars in these initiatives in those three states. And so they're investing in the priority watershed work, and again, that's all through partnerships, those local watershed districts or soil and water districts, others that are involved there, the Nature Conservancy is very involved there. The, uh, the SPARC program, they're investing in that. Uh, the Precision Conservation Management Program that's led by the Illinois Corn Growers and several partners in Illinois, they're investing in that program. You can see some of the science that they've invested in. And uh, actually, uh, the biggest investment is the $4 million investment, and I'd have to back up a slide here, that they've made in the Soil Health Partnership. That's a significant effort to expand those demonstration sites and really get that data and the science behind adoption of these soil health practices. Uh, I think I'm gonna just sort of end here. There, I mean, you can learn more about this on the, uh, the web. I think my key message here is that we are see, seeing you know, companies, corporations coming to the table in some very meaningful ways, I think, to help farmers uh, adopt the practices that you're interested in and then also then trying to sustain those practices in the long run. So with that, I think I just want to stop there because we can get into more later, perhaps. Super. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for staying in the, the last leg of the program. Uh, we greatly appreciate your, your time today. So what I will try to do is to give you a quick overview of one of the companies that has had the opportunity to be part of many communities for a long, long time, and how that works now towards the market, and then most importantly, in favor of the different communities that has been involved with us. The picture you see over there, it's in Yakima Valley. This is the place where around 95% of all the hops that comes from the Miller organization comes from. If for some reason we can get the varieties or the specific aromas or flavors from there, the only place to get them is somewhere in New Zealand. So the reality is that more and more these different companies are having way more exposure in terms of the risks and then the weather effects and different things that happens. So just for, for, a, for a general uh, big picture, uh, Miller Coors is just the US uh, business unit of the Molson Coors uh, brewing company. Uh, what you see over there is a map only of the breweries, but each of the breweries comes along with a significant region of growing and grains and different places where different ingredients come from, most likely barley and hops that they represent 95% of, of everything that the company sources around the world. Now, what, what kind of information is considered when any of these companies put together goals or aspirations. One good place to start always is what the United Nations have to say about this. The link between corporations and the United Nations is the United Nations Global Compact, and they facilitate the development of a number of goals periodically. So the last edition of these goals came last year. They put out around 17 global goals. These are very ambitious goals. They try to tackle from poverty to digital literacy. So these are really challenges from, from the whole humankind. So corporations have the opportunity to look at some of them and then try to align the activities, the strategies that we have to see if we can meaningfully contribute to some of them. I think ideally any company would like to tackle all 17, but the reality is that it, that's not possible. You need to focus your efforts and then keep your, your efforts meaningful and honest. So from those 17 goals, those are the six that Molson Course has selected to support. The second one on the, on the left side, it's around water. It's, about, it's around availability and sanitation. And again, remember, there, there might be places, and again, it's not that we are just spoiled here in the United States, but there are, there are gonna be places where there is no particular availability of water, or maybe the quality is not the right one. There are even organizations that are trucking water just to keep a facility running. Could you imagine the cost of that? So this is just the, from, from a facility standpoint. Now, a lot of companies, and, and we just heard a, a moment ago, 
are always looking within the four walls of their company, what we can control, what we can influence. So for us, that means, in, a, in many cases, the brewery, what we can do inside of the brewery. A lot of companies, especially in the food and beverage industry, are obsessed about ratios, efficiency ratios. So what you see over there is the resource to product ratio. For us, we call it water to beer ratio because we, we happen to brew beer, but soft drinks have someone, distillers have another one, technology have their own ratios. The reality is that companies like us that are industrial in size, we get the benefit to capture economies of scale. So therefore our ratio is very, is very low. We're essentially using around three gallons of water to produce one gallon of beer. If you compare those to different industries, completely different, soft drinks, for example, is more efficient. They are already operating at two to one, two gallons of water to produce one gallon of soft drink. But if we try to make the similar calculation for, let's say, a wafer for a computer, that's like 42 to one. But people don't necessarily connect that. It's like, for this technology that we have in our hands every day, how much water is embedded on it? Now, to go back to why is this relevant to us, even a company like us that is trying to reduce everywhere they can inside the brewery, if we do little changes inside the brewery, that equates literally to millions of gallons of water. But we had to do a general understanding of the water use, of the water footprint end to end, from field all the way to market. And then we realized that only 10% of water use in the whole company belongs to, to the brewery. So that opens the big opportunity to look into brewing materials operations, into the field operations. Now this is not, again, to, to paint any, any bad connotation upstream in the supply chain. You're similar to the example of Walmart. When Walmart, from a carbon side, when they decided to do a carbon footprint, they realized they, they are only, as big as they are across the world, they can only influence 7% of their carbon footprint. So that other 93% is the universe of companies that now are joining them in things like Project Gigaton and, and others. So with that opportunity of the 90%, and this is a, a, an eye chart, certainly no, nobody is supposed to read the, the fine print on anything. This is just to say that the company launched a number of global goals. We have 14 goals, five of them environmental, and two of them specifically into what we call the agricultural supply chain or brewing materials. One around just general sustainability and, and regenerative agriculture practices, and the second one very specific about what are the reductions we are trying to implement between now and, 2050, and 2025. Now, these numbers are certainly, and, and this is the, the beauty to some extent about goals, that they need to be challenging, yet they need to be attainable. So there should be a pathway, there should be a route or a roadmap to get there. So you are not just putting out goals that you don't even know how to get there over time. Now, going back to brewing materials, the Barley program in Miller, in Miller course is a program that has been around 70 years in existence, mostly in states like Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho. And we have had the opportunity to work directly with the farmers. That is not necessarily the case. There might be a lot of companies, a lot of even customers from you that they don't necessarily have that connection. There are one, two, or more tiers in between them and the actual producer. We have the benefit to know all the growers across the, across the, the company and particularly for the United States. So just going back to the global perspective, a lot of what we do in the United States and a lot of the barley that is grown here goes to other countries completely. From all the barley that the company produces, then more than a half it's from, from the United States production. There are other elements of, of this production, but just to put it in perspective, each of the barley growers essentially is growing barley for 1.6 million cases of beer. So just to put it in perspective, many people told me, hey, in the grain elevators, this one that we have in Idaho, how much grain is there? Essentially, the quantification is that two cans for every six pack go through that elevator. So just again to, to, to highlight the importance of this part of the business and the supply chain, over there in green is essentially the places where all the barley comes from, from this global company mostly. So could you imagine just from all the countries around the world, those are the states and the counties that provide the barley. So that level of exposure, it's a, it's a high risk for a, for a company that 
is looking into creating the right conditions for the growers and the partners. What you see over there are these same states and then the facilities that we have. Some of them are research and development centers, some others are grain elevators uh, as a whole. The reality is that the company needs to equip the community with the right tools to be able to deliver their, their specific work. Now, the philosophy of the company in terms of the barley program is that we have a variety program. We constantly work in crossbreeding to get the right variety of barley. Sometimes that right variety could be barley that it's more resilient to harsh winter or to even higher summers. Also could be that it, ne it might need less water or it might need a different mix of fertilizer. So that's kind of the part of research and development. And certainly the environment, something that we can necessarily control, but we are certainly influenced by the things that we do on an everyday basis. And most importantly, management. That comes back to all of us. When we partner with all of these 850 families of barley growers, they are independent growers. They come year over year, and they, under, they have a, a, a full reading of what the contract, of what the, the engagement is. So the average tenure of a barley grower with us is between 45 to 60 years. That's important because if you are having an annual engagement, what are you doing so the families are opening their doors year over year, year over year on that annual basis? And that, that has something to do with, with the community. So going back, and this is a, a lot of, of what we just heard in a, in a moment, there is the, the field to market collaborative. Field to market has developed a number of calculators. They have one called the field print calculators. And essentially these are only tools to make sense for organizations that are just more used to look at manufacturing metrics and indicators in that area of the business to take some of them and then try to implement them upstream in the supply chain. Now the reality is that that is not that easy. The same indicators that you can have any given minute, any five minutes, every shift, you, you can just generate them on the field, as we know. You might need to wait a full season for a meaningful metric. You might need to wait for several months for that to happen. So they took the time to get a, a number of organizations together, and most importantly, the leadership of the different crop growing associations. What you see over there, it's a kind of this polygon uh, spider diagram, and essentially each of those shapes, it's your pilot project, then the county perhaps, and then the state performance. The rationale here is that the smaller the area, the smaller the polygon, the better you are doing. Now what each of those uh, corners represent are some of these metrics, some, are, some around excuse me, land productivity, water efficiency, carbon. Now what kind of questions organizations like Walmart tend to ask companies like us? In the beginning, five years ago, that survey, that questionnaire used to be very balanced. They used to ask us about ourselves, about manufacturing, about logistics. They used to ask about the retailing piece. And then they used to ask about brewing materials, almost one third each, very balanced. Nowadays, 85% of all these surveys are about farming. Why is that? Why they want to know from you more than us as producers? Because there is a whole pool out there from consumers, from transparency, from collaboratives. People want to know where the ingredients are coming from in their food, in their products. And the middleman tends to be companies like us. So we assemble, we gather, we collect most of the information that we have available, but we need to fully rely on the community. What the community reports to us is what we collect, and that's the information that we can mine and calculate. Now, there are, what are kind of the conditions that as a company you are supposed to create as, as part of your strategy? What you see over there are a number of pilots that we have in Idaho. A few years ago, we started a, a normative farm or a model farm just to look into what kind of practices could benefit barley growing. So we took a number of different partnerships, including the Nature Conservancy, to start that normative farm. We documented the results, we shared among our farmers, but that wasn't enough. So then we looked for an engagement with NRCS, and we were very fortunate to look into a federal entity back then how we can manage and we, how we can team up. So we found Equip, and then we found that there was a huge overlap 
between barley growers or just growers at large, even in places where we don't even grow barley, places like Texas, places like, like California, where we don't go, grow barley, but we have brewing operations. So as a company, when you realize where you have the biggest risk, then states like Colorado, Texas, California will go up in that priority. So we start teaming up with NRCS, with Equip program to supplement essentially these, these conservation plans. So in short, from a con an, out an authorized or an approved conservation plan, NRCS could come back and reimburse after those acres have been uh, certified between 80 to 85 percent of the cost of the project. And then the remaining piece of that, a company like us will pay. So we're essentially building almost like a safety net from that producer that is taking a chance on putting a new crop on the ground or is doing something different from what they have done historically. So it's just about creating the right conditions, creating the right incentives for them. As I mentioned before, the magnitude or the, the scale of savings at the brewery level for us is millions of gallons. But changes in the brewing, in, in, the, in the agricultural supply chain, for us account to billions of gallons. Of course, two years ago, we had a very wet year. A lot of snowpack, a lot of rain in places like Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. Therefore, we were able to quantify some of these benefits. But the reality is that we are always subject to the environment. That is even worse in terms of the, the eye chart, but at least the header will, will convey that this is the result of RCPP at the end of 2016. Usually when you think about a corporation, you think about them as these guys, they have some budget, they do what, what they can, but they will never ask or create additional lines of funding. Well, I come from academia, and when I joined the company, I asked the team to look for what other goals we could attain beyond the budget to really influence the communities where we operate. And one of the ideas was, what about writing a proposal to USDA? or to NRCS. Of course, from a company, that was even a space that, of course, we got a lot of heat from foundations, from universities, from consultants, because it's like, hey, you are a corporation. You shouldn't be writing proposals to the federal government, or even worse, landing that budget. The reality is that there is no rule that forbids any other entity to write a proposal. If you want to go through that big process of, of writing the proposal and being, being invited back, Right now, that particular project in the state of Montana is funded for a number of four to five years, and we're just one of 10 organizations trying to advance agricultural practices, most likely based out of EQUIP, most likely based out of RCPP. So this is an example of how a public and private partnership could look like. And again, the company, really us, we are just putting a little bit of the expertise, the technical support is really coming from NRCS. So just to start uh, wrapping up, what you see over there, we started with that same picture on hops. The big change between barley and hops is that 850 families, that again sounds very small for a company like Miller Coors, well, the number of families in charge of hops for all this company is less than a dozen. So if you think you had a risk with 850 families, now imagine with 12 families. What happens if you lose one of the families? What happens if one of the kids or the next generation, they just don't want to stay in the family business? That is really a problem for us. So what we're trying to do is to, again, bring the technology, bring the opportunities, the funding for those generations to keep and stay in the family business. Now, hops growers uh, are really advanced in terms of technology, in terms of being progressive and proactive in the practices that they have implemented on their own with no incentive on our part, with no incentive on the federal government. Finally, one, one comment that, again, it's a reality. Sometimes when companies feel the pinch of risk and risk management, some of them have the luxury of packing up, closing shop, and then just go away, leaving the community behind. We'll just relocate our assets, we'll just relocate our people, that's it. We don't. We have been both in Colorado and Milwaukee around 150 years. North Wisconsin, Chippewa Falls, 150 years. The company has really put the effort in looking at railroads, putting grain elevators. Grain elevator, in general, is between nine to $11 million of investment. Those are things that the company undertakes on its own. 
This is not paid by the community. This shouldn't pay by the federal government. This is just the right thing to do to improve the level of service that your farmers receive year over year. So that is something that if the company is 150 years old, then we need to start investing in the next 150 years. Finally, just to, to recap, the, some of the, oh, oh, one of the pictures you see there is one of the silos where I mentioned a moment ago that at least two cans for every six packs you see, all of them go through that particular grain elevator. The other one, when you see a little bit of the community is what we call barley days. For us, barley days are the number of events or the, the, the abilities or the windows that we provide to acknowledge and recognize the community. I think there is a lot of, uh, have been said today about what the government does and what the corporations do and what others do. The, the real work happens on the field. The real work happens through you. And if no organization takes the time to recognize and award and incentivize the community, then there is a, they, they are overlooking a lot of the value that is happening. So we really take the time and put the resources to make this recognition available and visible all the time. What you see over there on the Lifetime Achievement Award, it's one communication that we did for the Beer Institute. Believe it or not, or not there is a Beer Institute in Washington, D.C. And they collect from all these companies what is the economic contribution in terms of jobs, in terms of, of safety, in terms of different things that happens around a particular industry. So with these farmers that have a long tenure, that they have been with the company since the very beginning, we take the opportunity to always recognize that. In the lower, in the lower picture, there is that, those, those signs are, of course, like all the old, old signs back from, from different campaigns. Every time a family reaches a five-year increment in their tenure with the company, five, 10, all the way to 60, now we're going to have this year a 65-year-old family on their tenure, they do receive a specific plaque that goes in the gate of their farm. And sometimes they really allow us to display it. So when you enter to their home, at the very, very entrance of the ranch, you see one of those plaques. So one of the things that, that we are very, very proud of is the ability to communicate with the community. None of this effort, no those collaborations, nor the efficiency, nor the ability to really respond to anybody like Walmart or anybody else, even our own consumers, could be possible if the farming community and the barley growers couldn't open their doors and then share their information with us. So with that, we'll, we'll switch into the, into the next one. Thank you. So uh, Bill Kanapke with uh, Cooper Farms, and I'll give you a bit of an overview of what we've done along the lines of sustainability uh, there at Cooper's. Maybe. Oh, on the side. Right here. Right here. There we go. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, give you a little overview of what Cooper Farms is. We're in Northwest Ohio. Uh, the home of uh, the Coopers is is Oakwood in Paulding County. Uh, in an annual year, we grow uh, about six million tom turkeys. One point two million of those would be antibiotic free. Uh, 624,000 antibiotic free hens. Most of the hens that we produce, we sell to other companies uh, throughout the South, Cargill and other such. Uh, so when we wrote, raise a tom turkey, they grow to 40, 45 pounds, and then they're completely uh, deboned and turned into deli meats and such. Hens are the ones that end up on your Thanksgiving when you get a whole turkey. So yeah, most people couldn't fit a 40 pound turkey in their oven at Thanksgiving and you'd have leftovers till New Year's. So, and then uh, process uh, 266 million pounds of live turkey a year, uh, about 700,000 hogs annually for 200 million uh, live pounds of hogs. Table eggs, 3.7 million hens, producing about 75 million dozen table eggs every year. And I thought I'd give you a list of some of the customers that purchase products from us. And this is mostly on turkeys and eggs. Is Kroger's, Myers, Target, Costco, John Morrell, and then Clemens Foods is the uh, hog processing plant that's gone in in Coldwater, Michigan, and we're uh, a part of that project. So we we deliver all of our pigs up to uh, 
to cold water now and then those would be sold under the Hatfield uh, label. And the turkey products and eggs, you're not going to see any uh, Cooper labels in the grocery stores, but we do what's called private labeling. So we'll make products for these companies, Kroger's, they have their own deli select and things like that. So we produce those products for them to sell. Oh, let me back up, sorry. Grain, so we purchase about 18 million bushels of corn a year and 170,000 tons of bean. Yep, so uh, 18 million bushels of corn and then uh, the bean meal all to be fed out of our four feed mills uh, that go to the breeder uh, division as well as a grow out mostly down in Mercer and Dark County. Carbon footprint, just to give you an idea of the supply chain, you know how that, uh, what all fits into the carbon footprint, whether it's transportation, deliveries, heating, fuel, uh, but the, the interesting part for us, and it, uh, it was alluded to earlier, you know, we don't have a big impact on the carbon footprint. The reality is that carbon footprint is determined by the uh, 18 million bushels of corn that we're purchasing for through the grain production, then that impacts, you know, growing turkeys and hogs. So, uh, so that's the reality of that. Uh, sustainability, really, uh, the three pillars are economics, environment, and social. And that can be summed up with uh, people, planet, and profits. So you can have a lot of great ideas, but if it's not economically feasible, if you don't make a profit at the end of the year, it's not sustainable. So, you know, you have to consider all of those factors, you know, from a company standpoint in determining, you know, how sustainable are our efforts. Uh, and then, you know, the environment, obviously that's pretty clear, I think, to everybody, you know, the soil, the water, the air that we're surrounded by, and then the social uh, effect that we have, whether it be jobs, communities, families, uh, all of those are part of that social uh, factor. So these are some statistics from the pork board from 1959 to 2009, over 50 years, uh, the land use to, to grow per pound of pig uh, is down 78%, water use 41%. So the overall carbon footprint's been reduced by 35% per pound, but 96% of the land footprint is on growing the crops, uh, the folks that we purchase uh, corn and bean meal from. 90% of the water footprint is for growing crops. So you can see, you know, when, when we look at our, so when customers such as, uh, whether it be Walmart, you know, they're the, the, the elephant in the room, they're the ones that make the waves. When they start talking to uh, companies like ours about our carbon footprint, we pretty clearly see that you know these are our challenges. We don't have control over over a large portion of our carbon footprint in producing protein. Marketing. So what I wanted to bring up with some of these slides is that you can see the. Uh, all of the different labels. And if you go in a grocery store and you walk down a food aisle, it, there are labels all over the place. And when they do surveys, they'll ask people, you know, do you look at the, the, the labels on the products? 40% of them would say, yeah, I look at the labels. And then if you ask them what percentage actually makes their buying choice based on that label, it's a very small percentage. But, but it is, it, it's still a part of the whole equation. Uh, a lot of it really is price driven for most of us in this room. I would say that, you know, price it probably determines, you know, 90% of our purchases, but there is, you know, that other segment of the, the purchasing public that really looks at the labels and they determine their purchases specifically off of that, whether it's non-GMO, organic, uh, 
you know, the list goes on and on. In the egg business, you know, the hot topic has been cage-free eggs over the last several years. Uh, the, the challenge becomes is that, you know, it's supply and demand. As soon as that supply is met, then the premium that you were going to receive for, you know, producing a specialty product, it goes away pretty fast. So it's a real balancing act. Uh, I had up on there the antibiotic-free turkey that we produce. Uh, things change pretty quickly, and there's a demand for those things. But say our cost is uh, more than slightly higher on producing antibiotic-free turkey meat when when the customer has had their fill of it and they don't need any more, then we have to sell that turkey meat, but we don't get to sell it at the premium. It goes right into the flow with the rest of the turkey meat. So, so then it just simply raises our cost, overall cost of, of the product. So trying to keep up with uh, a changing market and demands is quite the challenge, you know, for our uh, sales group. You know, they want to go out there and get those premiums, but then at the end of the day, uh, sometimes it's not worth all of the extra effort for the little bit of profit that you made on a percentage of that product that you produced. So I think from a grain farming standpoint, you're always evaluating, you know, are you going to grow non-GMO crops? Or are you going to try to grow organic and stuff? And you have to weigh those things out to determine, you know, what is uh, best for your bottom line and for your, for your production system. What can you handle? What can you do? Sustainability efforts, um, one of the things that we've tried to work with, uh, because like I said, we don't have control over uh, the grain production. We're just simply purchasing grain from, you know, farmers from, oh, anymore, at least a hundred mile radius from our feed mills. So the number of producers that we work with is pretty wide and varied uh, for sure. So what, in we're, we simply can't, you know, when I talk to our grain purchasing folks and talk to them about these things, so what kind of a premium could we pay for a guy that's going to produce corn on a, you know, adhering to a certain set of standards? And he's pretty clear. He says, N I can't pay you any. We're not going to pay anything extra. And he said, the, the margins are like this, and competition's fierce, and if we're going to ask them to do something extra, you know, they're going to find it much easier to sell to the elevator down the road, and you know we're just going to lose our opportunity to purchase their their grain. So, the next best idea was, well, how do we try to uh, uh, benchmark where we are on our producers and the per people that we're purchasing grain from, and how can we demonstrate that they are doing a lot of sustainable uh, production practices? So we put together a group, and we call it an ADAPT network, which uh, the soybean folks in Iowa uh, started that type of program. And so we just tried to follow suit in our area and put together a group of 15 to 20 producers, uh, visit, talk about uh, opportunities and practices that we can do so that we can demonstrate and then benchmark and get better. So. Uh, the benchmarking, you know, put together a survey that says, you know, how many acres are you soil sampling annually? What percentage are you grid mapping? Are you soil sampling by soil types? Trying to get a feel for where are we today? How many of you are doing cover crops? How many of you are pre-side dress nitrogen testing? A lot of the uh, typical practices that a person might be doing, uh, you know, including filter strips. Do you have a CNMP? Uh, all of those type of things to get kind of a score. And then as we move forward and then set up some trials that, you know, pre-side dress nitrogen testing, try to help those producers get a little bit better. And we had some, some uh, positive results, producers that learned a few things along the way. But change is tough. I mean, it is. I mean, when it comes to side dress nitrogen test and, and you've got hundreds of acres to get done, uh, how many people want to slow down and take time to do a test and coordinate and things like that. So uh, very, very challenging for sure. Uh, and then getting back together at the end of the year to share that info once we've gathered the results from those trials and stuff to 
show you know what was uh, accomplished or the the benefits of the side dress testing so that in future years you know it's not us trying to coordinate that then the farmer takes that on himself so we had i will say modest uh success with that it's tough like herding cats uh and unless you're dedicated and really have a lot of time to to put towards it uh, pretty hard to make that happen if you got other responsibilities it's it's hard to do uh, so nitrogen utilization pre side dress and test those were all some of the things that we attempted to to show uh, wheat rotation I just wanted to bring this up because it's something that I think is an opportunity and we're going to work towards it demonstrating the benefits of having wheat in a rotation and it may not be wheat it might be barley uh, it might be uh, other small grains but when you look at the just growing wheat the profitability is is just kind of what it is it's not a great deal but if you're able to put a cover crop out or do a double crop or use that uh, late summer time period for manure application or fertilizer and then utilizing it with uh, a cover crop and then showing the benefit in years two and three, then there is more benefit to, to having wheat in the rotation than just your receipts on selling wheat and or straw. So, it's something that we're working on and hopefully we can uh, demonstrate that because we think that there's some value to water quality in the environment by being able to spread that window out for timing of fertilizer application and uptake of those nutrients and storing them uh, and you know there have been several discussions today about cover crops and those type. one thing I will say is that uh, being a a livestock farmer and seeing the benefits of manure the benefits of manure are one thing but the benefits of manure paired up with cover crops I think has even more benefit I think that the two really fit well together uh, I think cover crops are enhanced by the manure application and there's no doubt cover crops enhance the nutrient availability of of the manure uh, I've been doing cover crops for several years don't have manure application on all our fields and it's tough to think about spreading you know extra nitrogen to get your cover crops going when it's kind of optional so but when you do it and you put manure out there besides you know you see the the increased benefit of it so so I think there's a that's a great opportunity for us uh, Technology, you know, this is hopefully our next uh, opportunity to uh, help producers with sustainability. Um, my thought is, is that if we can use things like Ag Solver and help a handful of producers implement something like that on their farms to determine, uh, you know, the, the most efficient use of nutrients, fertilizer, and or you know just simply having marginal areas in the field that really are not profitable at all and whether those become set aside or or something else that are more beneficial to water quality then then that's a big opportunity you know this field map just shows you know the the red zones and uh, maybe some of you have some experience with with looking at these but ag solver really takes into account all of your costs and the benefits so uh, so it's more than just a yield map. Yield maps are one thing, but looking at the whole picture of profitability and, and just adding a bunch more fertilizer to some of those thin areas on the farm, there may not be any net return from something like that, and, and this would help do that. So, so those are the type of things, you know, it's a, it's a big ship. We're not gonna turn it in a, in a very tight radius. It's gonna be a, a slow, uh, curve hopefully but hopefully we're moving in the right direction so uh, that's where Cooper Farms kind of sees its uh, ability to be involved in the whole supply chain thing and and looking at uh, looking at our carbon footprint and trying to meet the goals that uh, 
the consumers and the retailers have set forth is, you know, this is what they want, and this is where we think we fit in. You know, uh, I know there's other companies that have done uh, similar type things, and you know, we're kind of open to suggestion. You know, to try to find better ways to work with producers because uh, we work with say 400 contract growers on raising turkeys, pigs, and chickens, but you know, really we're buying grain from a thousand different farmers selling us grain. So, uh, so it's, a, it's pretty hard to get your arms around something like that. But benchmarks and knowing where we are today and where we are five years from now is what we need to be able to uh, report back to uh, the Walmarts and the companies like that. Uh, thanks very much, all three of you. I'm going to open it up for questions in just a second. I want to kick it off, though, with my own comment and, and question for these three. Um, when Larry and I were at TNC, you know, a lot of our colleagues were doing research to see what motivated consumers. Of course, we were trying to protect land and water and conservation matter, but it was like down number of 15 or 12. Guess what was up top? Health. Okay? Everybody knows health is a top one or two issue for people. So you're all feeding the world. We're talking here about getting nutrition. This gentleman over here asked a question earlier, and I interpreted your question a little bit differently about the protein content. And if people like David Brandt, perhaps you too, can deliver higher protein content into growing cattle faster and putting more nutrition in it, you know, that, that party ought to pay more for it. And that consumer will pay more for it if we can communicate it through these folks, the supply chain. Because I know my wife, when she buys, she goes shopping, she looks at everything, it's nutrition right there at the grocery store, right? So these gentlemen are talking about how you connect the consumer and the buying behavior through the supply chain to you farmers. And we've heard already this morning, and I've heard it over years, about differential uptake of nutrients, embedding it in our plants and in our animal stock and into our own tissue. And there's a little bit of research out there, Rafik would say not enough, he wants to do more, about how your great practices deliver preferential healthier food. So we can feed that great populace of the world in our own families these guys have power. You listen to the networks that they're working with. I mean, I was involved in the whole U.S. Green Building Council movement, right? That now is driving green building sustainability in my old real estate sector with my old buddies at JLL. Okay, this gentleman was involved in forest stewardship. It's driving harvesting sustainable timber. These certification movements are underway in many industries driven by this ethical consideration, consumptive behavior. But we put up there a number of brands around food. It's confounding. There's so many different brands out there. How does one select? So I think part of what's needed is a little bit of that clarity of, of um, communication to tap into that consumptive desire. And I, and I want, you have a, a unique situation with a select number of farmers. And so I, I'd like to have a little bit of dialogue, maybe comments for you and some lessons as to how somebody that doesn't have almost a family out there delivering their product can, can effectively engage people like David Brandt who wants to deliver his higher protein product to a select number of buyers. Maybe he needs to be selling it to you, Bill. So with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. Sir, you had one right here, I think. Yeah. So, like I mentioned, you know, doing some type of benchmarking, you know, doing surveys and such of the producers that we're purchasing from. We do grain meetings annually. Uh, it's a customer appreciation type thing and trying to fill out surveys and see if, you know, essentially we're moving the needle any. And I don't think that anybody necessarily needs to take credit for those changes, but I think being able to demonstrate and uh, uh, quantify uh, the improvements I think that's where the rubber meets the road and so for you know the companies that come in and do uh, sustainability stuff for uh, as a consultant that's what they're going to tell you you need to be measuring it and and so that's where that's where it starts I think one of the uh, that has been a challenge and one of the uh, efforts that we've been involved in, and it's been around now for about 10 years, is the field to market program where uh, most of the players in the supply chain, including you know the commodity groups and others, have come together to try to establish a way to measure that field print tool that you've seen 
in the presentation area is one way. In the MRCC, we're, you know, because we're trying to measure not only what's going on on farms through field print calculator uh, inputs, but then also the environmental outcomes of adoption of these practices and, you know, in, in terms of nutrient load reductions and things like that. And of course, in that case, you know, we're, that, that group's not setting up monitoring programs. We're, we're looking to what the, the EPA, Gulf of Mexico Hypoxia Task Force, USGS and others are using in their tools to, to monitor, monitor uh, progress towards those goals. That's quite honestly why, one of the reasons why we selected to align with those goals because we knew there were systems in place there. I think one of the most important things was to have a better understanding that there was a baseline anywhere around water, around nitrogen application, phosphorus perhaps, and uh, we understood first of all that there was a, just a, a traditional collection system. Everybody felt better about just having their handbook just here and, 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 and that was it. But when we were trying to collect that information, we found uh, honestly just uh, just illegible, illegible records that's like, is that a nine or is that an eight? Is that, I mean, really things that comes down to the basic data that you get, and those will become eventual decisions. So we start a number of programs around, you know, you can keep, you can keep the, the notebook, but little by little we'll do an exhibit or we'll ask a few questions. More the, Initially, where they were more descriptive. Again, maybe five, 10 years ago, we just ask uh, how many passes do you do in, in a single season. Uh, right now, it really comes down to quantify the number of gallons per acre, almost at the bushel level. Similar with nitrogen, uh, how many times do you apply nitrogen or just, just in general, it was, it was even binary, yes or no. Nowadays, no, nowadays it comes down to the number of pounds per bushel. So the, the reality is that all industries, and, and really, I mean, I think, Barley is really, we, we are way behind that, that other big grains that have been just more active, more progressive. We're almost really, almost, even with the barley program being 70 years old, in terms of collecting information or digitalizing information to eventually do other computations, calculations, and others, we're just starting that process. Uh, a couple of years ago, we launched a growers portal that essentially was just essentially the same forms that a family takes to and fill out to deliver their load at the elevator, they were just now on an Excel sheet or on, on, on a website. Exactly the same question, but just on a web page. That created so much noise and it was very difficult because it's like, no, I mean, I just fill it and here you go. And we said, no, we can, you can, you can come here to the lab or our grain elevator and we fill it along with you. But at the end, you need to be responsible of those those typing and, and, and that input. Because again, at the end, we are, most of the times, these companies are only the conveyor between the information that really comes from the, from the actual community. So I think that first of all, it was setting baseline. And of course, the, you can put any arbitrary goal that just the reduction for the sake of reduction. What a reduction, even from companies like us in soft drinks and, and beverage industries, there is a limit for that. It's not that reducing water use at some point, it will have an effect on protein levels or enzymes or different things. So I think when there is just an arbitrary, like a short-sighted just goal that by this year, this percentage, just reduce, 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 that's not the answer. The answer is to find how the interactions among those different elements will come to deliver that yield or that protein level or even better, that differentiate that community from others and therefore find those either extra incentives or opportunities for them to be rewarded. If you can do it, go ahead. If you can't, find the partners to do it. So that's kind of where, where it lasts. First a baseline, and then understand just directionally speaking where we need go, to go from there. Questions? Go ahead. 
that yes, I, I think that it's it's important to you know right now when there is so many platforms and social media has to some extent make it available or what as they call sometimes they they have democratized like the opinions and all that. I mean that, that's good. I mean we we respect everybody can have an opinion, and uh, but I think that sometimes things are maybe taken too far. For example, let me just put a quick example. There, there is a, uh, an electronic publication called the, the Mommy Blog. And the Mommy Blog, one of, one of those mommies, essentially start looking at some products in the supermarket and then kind of cross-references the ingredients with carcinogens. So she came up with a random list of different products that were on any given supermarket that could potentially cause, car cause cancer. So then a number of, of companies start you know, getting calls and there's gonna be like a backlash and so we're one of them, right? It's like, hey, there is an ingredient in some of your beers that seems to be carcinogen and what, what, what's, your, what's your answer? It's like, well, no, first of all, all our labels and ingredients are on the website. So any can go and read them right now. So, so everything is up there, number one. Now second, uh, sometimes not fully informed opinion, at least get the benefit of the doubt nowadays. And again, that's, that's okay. But I think that as any company that is looking into transparency, into good practices, you just need to be clear on what's your instance on one thing or the other. For example, we are not fans of uh, leasing or exchanging water rights. For us, water rights are sacred, so we don't mess with them. And we don't advise on, on doing anything with them senior or junior or in, inflow white rights, we just don't advise on, on, on those matters. Uh, there are organizations that actually, they, the business is all around that leasing and exchange. That's a line of business, we respect that, we just don't engage to that. Similar, similar with, with GMOs. Our cross-breeding program is a, is a research and development portfolio. There is an R&D arm in the company that has botanists, agronomists, full-time developing cross-breeding, the next variety of barley. And again, the rollout is not fast. I mean, the, right now, the last one, that is, that is the Bill Course 100, took seven years in the making. And the rollout is gonna be a three to five year rollout. So research and development, it will take its own, its own course. But I, as you said, maybe some connotations tend to be negative. Uh, as, as I put it a moment ago, there is like this triangle of research and development, management, and environment. And we really believe that the mix of those three are the ones that will take further. The, that, so I think that, yes, we respect all the public opinions. I do believe that the consumer is still in, a, in its infancy. I mean, honestly, we, all, this, all this reporting, and I know that we mentioned a lot of these big retailers and kind of the, the crunch on reporting and the burden on reporting, and we know you feel it as well, because many times we just transfer that reporting to you as well. So we, we are on the, same, on the same boat. But we realize that even if we report everything to the retailer, at the end it's about the consumer. The decision is in their hands. Similarly, on the other side, we can have all the technology, all the incentives, all the programs. At the end of the day, the decision and the practices and implementing those is in the hands of the grower. So at the end it's a discretion both of the consumer to pick in your product and then on the grower in applying or putting a, one practice over another. All this to say that companies like us are not stopping at just reporting to our retailers or the channels to go to the market. We are now taking this conversation to the consumer. Yes, there is a lot of noise and confusion. As, as it was mentioned ago, even seven years ago, Duke University did a study about eco-labels. And they determined that back then, almost seven years ago, there were officially 700 eco-labels, officially. I believe right now the count globally is around 10,000. So the reality is that do you need another label? Do you need another number? Do you need another color? Does the consumer even care? Imagine us, beer company. Do you think a beer drinker would care? <laughs> perhaps, perhaps not. So what we have, what we, but what, what I can tell you, what I can tell you, and I'll, just, and I'll finish with this, is that there are different shades in that spectrum. And the guys from marketing use this term called the slacktivist. The slacktivist tends to be a consumer that has seen your brand or your organization, has read about it, perhaps you have some marketing information out or your report, and they think or they believe or they know that you are trying to do things right. 
with the community, for your suppliers, for your, for your employers. So they could consider you. They, they have a, a higher intent of purchase of your product. That doesn't mean, unfortunately, that they will purchase your product for sure. So I think that that's why I mentioned the consumer side is in its infancy, but I think that at least what, pro what organizations like us can do is to be transparent, to timely engage with the growing community, upstream all the way to the supply chain, have the evidence, the information available, and then allow them to make the choice. At the end, people and markets will vote with their dollars. So we truly believe that. Just get, have the information ready and allow them to decide. Let me, let me start and, I, and I, will, I will be quiet for the rest. I know, I know it's late and we're, we're wrapping up. The, um, I, I'm not aware of, of any like, big, big major movement or survey ar around land grant universities, but one of the things we do in, um, in partnership with local universities in the, in the states where we source barley is, for example, the University of Idaho, as, as this university and many others, have their extension uh, services. And we partner and we have commissioned a number of papers and research from practical research and white papers to full peer review journals that, that go to, the, to academia. For us, we started in late irrigation window for barley. Again, going back to that slide of the billions of gallons, we said, well, if, if we even shut down the end guns or we do a transition into precision irrigation, that could save a few hours or even a day, but you multiply that for really the thousands of acres that the company is engaging with, that can really equate to a, a big change. So we started by commission that research. There were a couple of professors in their, in their school of, of, of agronomics, and then they developed that. But I think for us in our experience has been more like interested researchers, people that really want to advance this field uh, and really, I mean, for them, that was their line of research and inquiry. So we were able to find them and then engage with them. But I, I don't think there is a, I mean, it's like the comment that in, the, in a couple of panels ago is like the real numbers, USDA has real numbers. I think that a lot of people have deferred to some federal instances or, or, or bigger instances that just maybe periodically collect the information. I was just going to um, ask if we have a last question or two. Did you want to comment on that, Bill? No. Um, but I also want to mention that David Montgomery is writing his next book. He's got his fourth coming out specifically on nutritious food and, and how the soil, um, you know, will good ag practices will lead to more nutritious food. And he's going to research that and travel all over the world and do it again. And so what I ask all of you, if you have any data in your own farms or any access to data or practices, please channel it through us, let us know, because he's in the middle of investigating. And I know some of you are delivering more nutritious product and you want to get that word out and get buyers to pay more for it. Any last question or two? I want to thank you all for coming today. Look forward to seeing you in the morning. Have a nice evening. Thank you three very much. Thanks very much.